Pleasure to uh, introduce Ed. Um, uh, Ed, you won't have heard the, the rules about you should announce whether your intellectual property in these slides is green, free for all to share, amber asked first, or red uh, asked, definitely asked first. Um, uh, I first met Ed when I was a junior consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers, and he was a very senior and very intimidating uh, partner, uh, and eventually was a, was a global partner um, on the board. And two stories which I vividly remember are that we had this e-training that was rolled out across the whole of PwC government and public sector practice. And it started with a video of Ed giving an example of customer journey mapping in the criminal justice sector. Um, and uh, the first quote was, when the police catch a criminal, or scrope as they call them, um, and I, I was quite tickled by the idea of that going across all the computers across the whole thing and everybody being forced to watch this video as part of their compliance uh, training work. Um, he also gave me the immortal advice that don't hurry up to be a partner, because when you think partners are the, the top level of the organisation, when, when he became a partner, I think he's quite the same, discovered there are nine levels of partner. And, and within each of the levels, there are nine distinctions of them. <laughs> um, so, uh, I was aware from the start that um, uh, and Ed's reputation preceded him as a partner with a systems thinking perspective and a, and a challenging thinking perspective. Um, and that was applied not only in PwC, but in advising successive governments, particularly Labour governments, also Conservative governments, um, in supporting and uh, advising on the creation of uh, new Labour, um, and as a uh, board member of both um, Relate uh, and Demos, the, uh, the, the think tank. So it's probably no surprise that rather than um, peacefully uh, retiring, um, he's written a book about how we should re-engineer the whole of government uh, to be better, and I think very much from a systems thinking perspective, but copies of which uh, will be available uh, from Ed, signed, I'm sure, if you wish, yeah. uh, for, a, for, a, for a very good fee. Uh, over, over lunch, but the most important thing, um, the, the reason why I wanted to get here is to get the word out, so I think it's really interesting and exciting. So, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. And um, the, uh, the, I've put the books over there. Um, uh, there are a nominal five pounds, however, if I would far rather you read them. Um, so that, uh, I think Dean, pages 151 to 171, if you're really short of time, basically, <laughs> so I'm it, because I know we've got to Yeah, so if you've got a fiver, stick it in the plastic bag, and if you haven't, uh, take a look, but read it. Um, so, uh, how did I get to be standing here? Well, a very interesting uh, Ministry of Defence. So, if you were to go to the National Audit Office now, and pull out a report on weapons procurement, it would say, um, you know, it's over budget, uh, it doesn't meet spec, and it's horrendously late. <laughs> if you were to pull out the same reports uh, from the 1960s and 70s, you would find it says, it's over budget, uh, it's late, and it doesn't meet the spec. Which sort of got me thinking in a broader sense, so not a lot's changed. But we have the Public Accounts Committee, don't we? And these people get beaten up publicly. This must be an effective process. And you see Margaret Hodge and the previous one pounding in, really, giving it. But actually what happens if you go to the Ministry of Defence, the, the permanent secretary, the head or whoever it is, comes back and covered in scars, but wears the scars with pride. The staff are incredibly pleased with this great hero that's taken the flag, and life goes on. But then we appoint a new head, don't we? We, we appoint a man, or indeed we appoint a woman, or from the private sector, you know, he's got lots of experience, knows everything, all will be well. And then it still isn't, because I think as we all know as systems thinkers, and, and where this comes from, it's particularly an organisational alignment, which is uh, the same thing in many respects, although I appreciate the differences. If you just take one lever in the whole organisational system and you leave everything else the same, so you leave the way <coughs> which staff are motivated, paying, employed, where they come from and all the rest of it. Okay, there's a bloke up there yelling at me. Why on earth should I change? And anyway, all the performance measures and the processes and the procedures and so on the same thing. 
So this is essentially born out of a working lifetime of frustration. Um, that having had all these experiences, I started off in 2010 with uh, a root cause analysis, uh, a causal analysis of why labour lost. Because I looked at this thing and politically it was unnecessary, but it was also inevitable. And I identified 19 root causes. How did I do that? Well, I went and talked to about 400 people. Mainly, I mean, people in the system, but the really important thing is people outside the system, people who observe it from, from, you know, sound engineers and gardeners and doctors and dentists and management consultants and so on and so forth. Um, and then I traced all of those 19 top causes through to the roots. Time and time came, came back to the system, uh, or another word for the system of government is the Constitution. And I took that to a publisher and the publisher said, well, uh, that's all very well, Ed, but you know, it's a bit passe, it's a bit narrow. Why don't you expand it to why governments fail? So fine, off I went and sort of broadened the whole thing out. Run a publisher and uh, said, well, yes, yeah, all very well, but <laughs> critiques, uh, I mean, not ten a penny, and yours is quite a good critique, and could be interesting, but, but how are you going to make them succeed? So then I did that, and uh, that's how we got to be here. Rest of that. So what I hope to uh, show is that governments fail or are ineffective, judged by our expectations, their intentions. I don't think I'll need to convince you of that, but that's the starting point. This is the crucial point. The system of government have never actually been designed. So if you go back to when the constitution was invented, rule of law, human rights, representative democracy, none of them spent 40% of GDP on vast arrays of public services. None of them were expected pretty much to solve every problem. Parliament in relation to the Irish potato famine, nothing to do with us. Off you go, Charles, can you imagine that today? Decision complexity, globalisation, the impact of uh, supranational uh, 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 authorities, technology, etc., 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 never been designed. I've come up with a design. Um, it, it, the emphasis, is, well, there's a the there, sorry, in the book it says A, uh, Treaty for Governments. And I'm really, really interested in, okay, you know, does this work? Does it stand up to your own? <laughs> okay, now, um, oh, there's two points here. One is, uh, when I was at PWC and CNL, there were loads of people that did all of my slides for me. So anyway, <laughs> this, I hope, is my first attempt, my very first attempt at PowerPoint. Uh, and you'll find one or two issues here and there. It's not bad, and I was quite pleased. So, <laughs> do, do, yes, room for improvement, I accept. But, um, um, okay, the other thing I want to say, system, okay, you know, you probably bounce back, yeah, is that a system? I, I, I'm trying to get across, and there's quite a lot of detail, actually, I'm trying to get across, if you like, the top line of all of this. So essentially, this is how it works, isn't it? We select a government, they make decisions, policies, they're operationalised, delivered, we get results and outcomes, running along the bottom, we've got checks, balances, you know, House of Lords, all of that sort of stuff, National Audit Office, monitoring audit. Out at the end comes this line accountability, and we all go, whoa, end the round, I think we'll elect that lot rather than that lot. So, we've got the process of election of political parties. We, we select on the basis of the offer, uh, the values, and the record. But of course, particularly the record, well, and the offer, is mediated by uh, limited or, or, or indeed downright distorted information. We've got this bizarre accountability catch all where book open to the story of the central line and actually closed for three months. 
And it's like, you know, all of those issues that we want fixing within government, locally and nationally, get sort of heaped into this basket, and then you go, oh, that lot's going to do better than that lot. First past the post, uh, the dismal choice. Do you want George Osborne or Ed Balls as your choice of the Exchequer? <laughs> well, how about someone else? Um, uh, of course, duopolis. Very low standards of competition, I'm afraid. You know, two automotive manufacturers, two supermarkets. Well, we actually, I'm afraid, only have two political parties to choose from, and so things go down and down and down. And indeed, for long periods, if you take the 80s, essentially, the Labour is unelectable then, and you take the 90s to the mid noughties, Conservatives unelectable, essentially don't have any choice at all. Um, unrepresentative, and there are hidden and high costs. Um, one of which is the way in which we do zigzag government. So here we are in the canoe. Ever, ever been in a canoe? And it tends, I find, to go that way, and then, you know, and then you go that way, and so on and so forth. Um, I won't tell too many stories, actually, because otherwise I'll just run over time and won't get to the point. But there's, a, there's an interesting one about the divorce canoe. We can come on to that later in, uh, in the rare game. But so public expenditure goes uh, is insufficient. Uh, Thatcher had run down the public services in the 80s quite deliberately. New Labour gets in. Uh, I mean, you got on a train. It was like sort of you know riding on a train in the developing world. Mine overshot rugby. You know, <laughs> actually had to reverse to get back to the platform. This is madness. So New Labour comes in and uh, gets the expenditure up. By the time 2010 comes, talk to people in local government, too much money being shelled out to the public services, so in come the uh, coalition in this case, and pretty pounds off. And so we do that, and you'll see that all over the place. No consensus on secondary schooling, so we go, uh, and then uh, sensible countries, you'll find to go, this is quite important. I think we'll agree as to how we're going to do this, rather than putting it into a political football. So that's how we select governments, I mean broadly. Okay, then we're in government, how do we take decisions? There's various categories here. We are, by and large, a long way at the end. So how, you know, talk to people, how do, where do these decisions come from? And how, and uh, a fair number in the bath. I've uh, had an experience, uh, it was a train crash, uh, a Secretary of State for Education, Kenneth Baker, in the 80s, and I happened to end up in a taxi with him because I found a way out. You know, being a good consultant, you all can be relied on to find a way out for crisis. So we journeyed back, and I mentioned that local education authorities, I thought, were, you know, not basically a waste of time. You know, years later, I'm horrified to find... It's your fault. <laughs> this, this passing comment, you know, let's just try and have a conversation. Suffice it, why not pause it? Now, I, th I think there's, there's, there's sort of truth in that, but, but then how you're going to reconstruct it is a different, different matter. Yeah, we do get some research and analysis, you know, from time to time. Often the best uh, uh, policies, the best decisions come from the party and opposition really working on something hard, not in government, and so they come to government with a well worked through policy, and it works. Of course then, and this happened to New Labour, the longer you're in government, the less that space is there, the less that time, so you know, events dear boy, 24 hour media and all the rest of it, and their hit space just diminishes almost to nothing. I think the people Sometimes re referendum, deliberation, engagement. The classic one here is uh, Switzerland, where we do this properly. Now, do you want to spend 3.2 million Swiss francs on the park and ride scheme into Geneva or not? Accompanied are independent technical papers, which you can read if you want, and there's a relatively open debate about the whole thing. If you want the vote, you then vote on the scheme and uh, that often leads to much better decisions. <coughs> the influences, and uh, I, 
you know, apologies, I'm not getting enough of the system stuff, but it was just, it was a good check to me. What are the influences on all of this? Well, ideology, you know, unfortunately, usually. Economic theories. Oh, watch out. Um, we're into a stage of perpetual public sector reform. You know, we just reform it, don't we? We reform it, we reform it. Why? Well, we reform it. This is a good one as well. Something, you know, as a crisis, some, some poor child gets murdered. Something must be done. Anything must be done. And the political system responds by doing something. Dunblane Massacre. I agree with this. We've got the uh, banning of high handguns. Has the banning of handguns uh, had an effect subsequently? Other than to piss off a few people that go down and shoot them in uh, rifle ranges. I don't know, but it'd be interesting to find out. Um, media campaign, public, and so on. So that's cool. It's pretty random. I mean, if, I'm sure all of you have been involved in this, or just observe it from the outside. And it's, it's that's I've organised. Um, I think it's slightly out of order. Sorry. Results and outcomes. Now, can any system work without feedback? It's a sort of breakthrough <coughs> point that I woke up with one morning. Actually, the whole of human existence and the way in which uh, nature and ourselves have developed and evolved depends on feedback. Uh, can you imagine running an organisation where you have no clue as to where it is or where it's going? Uh, you have no results or outcomes. <laughs> well, we get a bit, and some of it's even independent. You know, it's not spun, it's not Alex Ferguson saying, ah oh, yes, Manchester United versus Arsenal, Manchester United won. You know, people other than the uh, participants declare the results. So we get some from there, some from there. Uh, we, this, this can do some really good work, but is owned by the Department of Health. Um, National Audit Office, I'm afraid, has, has been sort of asleep for, for 30 years in my experience. Um, yeah. And you do get some good stuff out of there, but it's mainly self-scoring, unrecorded, and or spun. Um, checks, monitors, and audit. So, if you think about, you know, this is supposed to be a terribly important process, well, stuff, you know, the, for legislation, there's an immense amount of process. I mean, how much of it, 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 it works and has, an, has in fact making it better is questionable, but immense amount for but mostly, it just goes through. And it will only not go through if you get, I don't know whether you're familiar with these internet campaign groups, uh, 38 Degrees, and mass and so on, actually having some very good impacts now, but it is by exception. The media may create a storm, for better or for worse. Indeed, we, the public, may create a storm, for better or for worse. But other, that's the only check there is. Mentioned the results. So the proportion of government actions in the round that's checked and monitored is, is low. Excuse me. Right, um, what happens next? Um, major flaws in the existing system of government. So, you know, if you, if you do what I did, oh, I, I should I should have mentioned, should I? I was actually taught by Stafford here at uh, Manchester Business School, apparently this gives me some sort of cred. <laughs> <laughs> and I do actually remember what it said, but no, right. um, But if you go back to, you know, the viable system, this is not a viable system. Uh, it's in fact a completely unviable system. Uh, and, and, you know, it's the system, not the people, if it is what, often what I say. What the next system is, it matters far more than who the next Prime Minister is. There's no written constitution, and the constitution is a tamper-proof system. But you can read, you know, democracy, accountability, preferential lobbies. There are eight reasons why preferential lobbies can flourish anywhere in the world. Guess how many Westminster has? That's all eight in the design or the undesign of the system. Politics in the wrong places. I think this is an interesting one because the civil service are going, oh no, 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 we do delivery. Well, <laughs> have you ever met the delivery that comes out of the civil service? I'm terribly sorry, Matt, but with the best one in the world, you may have a first PPE in Oxford. However, the delivery is crap. 
So what are we appointing, what are we electing politicians for? Well, actually we're electing them to get something done. Now, I'm not electing them for the rhetoric. You know, I'm austerity rhetoric, I'm anti-austerity rhetoric, result somewhere in the middle, actually. I'm electing to get something done. So politics in the wrong places, not in, in, in uh, delivery. However, checks, monitors, audit, is that political? Should the House of Lords in any way be political at all? Well, no. I don't want to argue that as to what the result, the outcome is. I want that to be absolutely straight. This is another one, we'll come back to that. The quality criteria for assessing policies, ruthless clarity, blah, 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 too few people fit for purpose. They may be very nice, they may be very clever. I've worked in plenty of organisations, well, I've worked, I've been on one board in particular where we collectively in copy. And it, I hope it wasn't because I was an idiot. However, in those circumstances, I and the others were not fit for purpose. And that's the point. It, anyone familiar with North Coke Trevelyan, um, which has essentially established the civil service system that we know today in 1853, I think it was, they start off with the phrase, it's not against the people, it is against the system that we raise our concerns with. Um, but on, and government seek to reform everything except themselves. Um, well, you know, policy, I mean, that's what we do, isn't it? And we've just had an election, everything's solved, isn't it? Except, unfortunately, being a bit old, um, you find that it's not. Um, and of course, we've, we, I remember the days, you know, the, the big um, socialism versus capitalism, social justice versus inherited justice. I, you know, being we, we, we uh, homosexuality, abortion, contraception, you know, all, all illegal or semi-illegal, and these were made illegal. Made, this were made legal. This was astonishing leaps forward. But we've done all of that. And I call it an ingenuous score and draw. You know, we've got regulated market capitalism and we've got social justice. So the question then is that you find all this political cross dressing. You know, we find Cameron doing a hoodie, we find Labour going, oh, shock horror, police numbers are coming down. It's an outrage without any reference as to whether police numbers actually make any difference to uh, plus or minus to whatever it is that we're trying to achieve uh, through that system. And I stand back and I go, hang on, don't we all want you know, a pretty crappy education system, a really good health service, don't we want the banks operating on planet Earth, this climate chaos thing, I mean, even if you only address it at a risk management level, we really ought to be getting on and doing something, high class public, etc. Et et Where is the politics in all of this, in objective terms? What makes it left or right, you know, big states or small states or public or private? I, I just don't see any of that as relevant. And also, I think the other thing is there are, there are some big arguments around immigration, for example, and around neoliberalism in economic terms. But I think if you get a viable system operating, it brings down the space for disagreement because actually, once you get into the analysis, there's a relatively narrow range, like you wouldn't do neoliberalism, uh, and you have balanced immigration. You can go into those in some detail, but that it narrows the space uh, that there is for political debate in the traditional sense. More democracy, that's great. Proportional representation obviously helps the zigzag because you've got a mediating force on board. Mm -hmm find less, far less argument about school systems uh, in countries with proportional representation. Uh, Italian friend couldn't understand all these private schools that we have over here. In Italy, private schools are for the mad and the bad. Um, you know, I mean, it would be nice to have a sort of similar <laughs> apologies to everyone who went to a yeah, private school. Um, to make direct democracy helps, uh, but uh, in Switzerland, for example, that there's not, although that vast move forward, there's not the feedback, there's not the policy assessment uh, uh, criteria. 
So, uh, that's a summation. This one is, uh, yeah, no, this is fine. A lot of an an analysis went into the whole thing, which you can read about. Ancient constitutions, politics, democracy. This, all of this applies to everywhere. I mean, the problem with the EU, I'm a convinced European always have been, be madness to leave, and the EU needs a bigger sort out of this Western stuff. It also has an unviable system of government. Modern remit and so on. So, we need uh, a, uh, a system with baking breath. Ah, um, just, just quickly, so people trying to get across the sort of constitutional message, you know, by and large, I call this the C word, because, you know, you mention the C word, and other like, unlike the other C word, you were essentially <laughs> fall asleep. <laughs> so trying to get the message across that this is really, really, really important, I think, is uh, significant. Lots of talk about, you know, the great success of the uh, Olympics and so on in London. I was talking to the IOC in Lausanne in the late 80s, early 90s sort of time. We've been set the task of uh, London's Olympic Challenge. I, I don't know whether anyone remembers back to that, but the notion that London could actually mount an Olympics, well, you just got laughed at, you know, it's absurd. Um, so we did a, a report, we looked at all of the bids, we looked at the way in which uh, the ones that succeeded, uh, we set out a template for how to succeed. Um, Sydney adopted a template and they succeeded. Uh, went back to the ISC and so that's terribly interesting. We seem to have some repetitive problems at the Olympics. Uh, the transport's always up the shout, um, uh, the ticketing's always up the spout and something else is as well. They're based in Switzerland. In Switzerland, they do understand why constitutions matter. And it was a slow process, and, and a, you know, I, I'm not sort of credit claiming, but I think it was a stimulus, or what we've done with stimulus is um, sort of stimuli that FIFA currently needs, leaving that to one side. Um, uh, and they come in, you get a contract, there's a legally binding contract. The opposition has to agree. Um, uh, they they set up the company structure and how that company structure is to be uh, uh, composed, etc., etc. They put in the system. This is the reason the Olympics 2012 works. Nothing to do with Seb Coe. He was very useful into boat getting. He's terrific on that. A bit to do with the fact that we did have some competent politicians, Ken Livingstone and Tessa Jow, but mainly it's the system. What did it? And so on. Um, when you say rules that you get, can you just clarify? Well, I use, I use the analogy here. Uh, football started off in Wales, uh, in the valleys, I think in uh, 1850s, uh, and uh, you had a ball and you had two mobs from opposing villages, and the objective was to get the ball into you know, the, 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 the barn five miles up that road or the, whatever it was down that it's, road. It's still doing dodge. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It is it, and it's very good fun. However, um, uh, the game as it now evolves, um, which um, I, um, you know, I do use a Scrabble analogy in the book as well for people who can't stand football. Um, as the game now evolves, it's, it's the rules that have made the game. The reason the game is so successful. You, know, you don't see Lionel Messi uh, you know, sort of scrabbling uh, with 500 other people. You see his brilliant skills so the rules became another area where the constitution. So I appreciate that there's a lot in this, but this is, and I will go through it. This is my attempt to bring together what would be a viable system for the UK, and I'll pick out some of it as we go through. Um, feedback, as we said, <laughs> and I try to use this practice. So independent feedback on everything done by government. Ignorance of the result is no defence for a politician. Legislation, where's the league table that sets out for each law its cost, roughly, both to government and to us, which is often forgotten. And it's effectiveness. And then we come to the bottom of this and we look at cost versus effectiveness. And there's a whole pile of stuff Yes, there should be a law against this, and there should be a law against that, 
but it doesn't work. By the way, there are an awful lot of better ways which you can observe around the world at, for example, reducing litter. Australia didn't go for a law, they went for a public education campaign. It seems to have worked pretty well. Policies and programs, you assess those. Government bodies, uh, stakeholder assessments, in, in the sense of getting feedback into the system as how they're performing. I rather like the instant feedback one. So if you're on a boat uh, on the Irish Sea, probably on a boat so from Holyhead to Dublin, go in the loo, when you come out, there are three buttons, you know, good, okay, bad, uh, that you can press instantly on the quality of your experience in the loos. I would like to be able to do that with HMRC. <laughs> I come out of HMIC and I can instantly press the buttons. Or a thousand other experiences that I have in relation to uh, the renewable heat incentive, which I, I bumped into the other day. In the wood pellet world, is incentivizing the consumption of fuel. This doesn't seem to me to be the point, does it? Feedback forums and TripAdvisor. Much more informed, but also balanced approach to the operation of these bodies. So all of that, and I'll, I'll again, I can come back to many of these things. The result here, somewhere or other, this has to be done. Okay? And it has to be done properly. It has to be done independently. You've got three separations of powers, the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. I'm proposing that we have a form. And that result will be based in the second chamber. House of Lords in our case, and that would have to be uh, that would have to be uh, reformed, obviously. Right. I've got a 20 minute sign, so I'm gonna Okay, so then we come on to the other end of the pipe. Policy by design. Uh, and you'll I borrowed a you know professional policy making prevents piss poor performance, and you'll know where that comes from. You can actually force any policy you want through the machine, or indeed, super through the machine. Well, don't we all know an awful lot more about policy making, decision making, than we did 50 years ago? I propose 10 tests. The point test. What is the point of what you're doing, no government? Legislation doesn't actually include, at the top of it, the point. I didn't realise this, and I suddenly thought, ah, no wonder so much of it is a waste of time. So what's the point of doing this? You'll see a lot of other things, you know, the systems thinking test. I mean, example, this, some people find this a bit difficult to swallow, which is perhaps the wrong point, but, you know, big push on uh, reducing smoking, excellent, you know, great, brilliant, uh, and then look at obesity, dong, and then look at the combined, bonk, costs, mortality of both, pretty much equal. Look at the foresight diagram, you're probably familiar, with a wonderful systems uh, diagram. And underlying a lot of this stuff, not for everyone I know, some of it's habit, is um, how we feel about it. So it's both overeating and smoking are drugs of solace, essentially. So you then say, okay, well, we've done that, it's great. How much of that has gone on to that? Not all. But you all have um, perhaps less controversial, I'd like to chuck in controversial things just to sort of uh, test me and everyone else. You'll probably have other things. How are you going to deliver it? What's it cost? Oh, and sometimes we should, should say there's a case for experimentation. Um, the operationalise, the delivery, I've proposed that for everyone in the public sector there should be these 13 public sector duties. I mean, deliver results. It's not unreasonable, do you think? <laughs> deliver within the whole of the public sector. In other words, operating as a silo is a hanging offence. By the way, if you've got feedback going across that's probably the best defence against silos, isn't it? Because suddenly you're focused on the point, an outcome, rather than my little bit. Speak straight. 
please don't tell me on a train that the reason the train is delayed is because it's half term and uh, therefore there are extra people travelling. <laughs> what you should have said was we decided against putting on extra carriages, even though uh, it is half term, but we know damn well that from in perpetuity there is going to be overcrowding because our contract is written so badly and weakly by the folks at Daft, as private eye calls them, that we can make more profit that way. That's the announcement I wish to hear. Okay, my book. Um, they're all up. And yeah, best organisational practice, and you may well be able to improve on this, but alignment, you know, the aligned organisations. I've used the Burt Liquid model, use whichever one you want. You've got to have everything pointing in the same direction organisationally, otherwise it's not going to work. Very briefly, real local government. We don't have real local government in this country, with the exception of some uh, emerging uh, areas with executive mayors. We have local authorities. 90-95% of the decisions are taken uh, by central government edict or by the officials locally and therefore there is zero accountability to the folks locally on top of which only a quarter of the local spending is funded locally and uh, as I've said on other occasions the old phrase perhaps this go no taxation without representation from Boston Tea Party also there is no a record of bang on getting yourself confused the other way round. In other words, if you tax people, then people are focused on the organisation. Um, so we need real local government and the law of requisite variety, I'm pleased to say, having um, revised on it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely spot on, isn't it? And it's always been absolutely spot on, and the notion that you could possibly control all of this from here is absurd. Oh, the abandonment programme, absolutely crucial. Peter Drucker was saying a lot of this in 1969. I mean, I wrote the book and then I, I the sickness of government, uh, Peter Drucker, 1969, and I thought, oh, that's a bit deflating. <laughs> I think I've gone a bit further. But, but yeah, so, so as a result of the feedback. It's just in good company, couldn't you? Well, <laughs> Um, as, a, as a result of the feedback, uh, you abandon things, and you quite specifically abandon them. And can you imagine the costs that would fall away? And, and you don't do it in a stupid way. I mean, you ideally do it in this at the time of growth, yeah, so that uh, people can get transferred into other occupations relatively easily. And you don't do it, you know, ah, oh, right, we're going to close the mines, all of them now, bang. <laughs> um, if you do it in a sensible way, but you have an abandonment program, um, absolutely crucial. Um, <coughs> people, what, what should I forget? Ah, a new civil service. Some people, I've made this mistake, incidentally. I wrote a pamphlet for Demos uh, in 2006 with the title which appealed, I think, to many in the civil service called The Dead Generalist. And Writing this book, I realised you can't reform the civil service in isolation from reforming the whole system. And that's been the problem. We, we need traditional civil servants who do a really good job. If you've seen um, you know, the old Danish uh, stuff, Morgan or any of that, and you see the traditional civil servants fulfilling that traditional administrative process, a parliamentary uh, legislative role, brilliant. And then this, this lot needs to report to the lot that we have elected for delivering things. So, it's so like executive mayors, Ken Livingstone arrives, new executive mayor, Fraser London Assembly, and he sacks the top 27 managers of Transport for London. Because they're not up to it, and he brings in people who are really good at it. And the whole system improved very substantially. Plateau since Boris got him, but he's a comedian. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's a sign of the times, though, isn't it? Who do we elect as, you know, as our politicians? Well, you might as well have a comedian, because at least you get a laugh. Limited terms of office, blah, blah, House of Lords, yeah. When you and say limited terms of office, is that the... Um, um, 
like the President of the United States, you can only stand for a number of terms, so you can't have it's any absurd. I mean, I've seen some of these people, you know, two, two terms for four years, you'll be knackered at the end of it anyway. Mm. You, you'll be so reined in with everything. I think Cameron's got there already, that actually the only reason for being in power is to be in power. Mm. That's not terribly helpful. The chances are that you line yourself up for dementia or Alzheimer's. I don't mean that unkindly, I just mean that my observation. These are incredibly pressured jobs. And, I'm, I mean, I was in Relate for, I was chair for six years, and we did a lot, did a lot, did a lot. And it was sort of getting to the end, to getting to the point where I could have gone, but also, you know, my tool bag is only so big. I mean, I think I've got quite a good tool bag, but it's only so big. A, B, people get tired of your voice. C, actually, if someone else comes in, they bring a sort of different angle, and there's a need to consolidate in relate, whereas I'm not exactly a consolidator. And so I stood down, I was sort of semi-pissed off, and then I looked back and thought, that was exactly the right thing to do. Um, yeah. Right. Elect. Again, it's just, this isn't only about that lot. If we don't learn how to apply intelligence in our judgments and are motivated to do so, the system will not function as well as it could. Right. Competitive democracy, I think, covered most of this, and fair shares, we can go into that, but, but I, need, I think we need in the Constitution, this is slightly, but we need a fairness deal. Um, you know, intergenerational fairness, uh, okay, uh, you lot, uh, in the future, uh, could you kindly pay for my pension, because uh, I haven't saved anything up. I'm sorry, that's there. Climate chaos, well, we can't really be asked to do anything, so again, you can pay for what we've done, and debt, you know, same issues. So, it, this isn't just a system in isolation, it's designed to do all of these things, including reducing taxes. You know, this might sound a bit sort of radical, and if you then want to spend those on something else, that's absolutely fine, or you want to reduce taxes, that's absolutely fine. But this is not just about, we all need to be terribly clever and intellectual. There's some very hard outputs to this. Um, and it would end preferential lobbies. So last slide, I think, how do we make this happen? You know, it's been a challenge. Yeah, it's all very well edgy coming up with something like this. But, um, so we need to elect some parties who are committed to putting the treaty in place. You employ, however you do that, sound economic management, there is an economy to be run. Events will happen and you need to be ready to respond to them, but you don't do anything else. No public sector reform, no heroic acts to do this, that or the other. Wouldn't that be a relief? And particularly to the people working there, so we all have a bit of quiet. You need really, really strong, or we need really, really strong deliberation. They did it in Canada with their uh, change to their health system in the early 2000s. This is professionally run, professionally organised. It's like, if you like, what happened in Scotland with the independence thing, but, but there's a lot better, less information. There's a lot more consideration. But you talk to people in Scotland about how that process went, and their ability over the dinner table to actually take very opposing points of view and still emerge at the end of the day as friends. Uh, that's uh, good deliberation. Then we have a vote, a referendum. It goes in the Constitution. Constitutions are owned by the people, not by Parliament. Uh, this, you know, the notion that government somehow owns the Constitution. Actually, the Constitution is there to control you and the system. Uh, and then, of course, we've got to go on, get on and do it. I think that concludes my pitch. Thank you very much.